Give them a round of applause for joining with us today. Amen. Amen. How many love Jesus? Say amen like you mean it. Well, I put in here, I, I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit about, most of us have heard about faith. But this past week when I was at uh, General Council, I was watching some of these men and women that get up there and some of the ministries that they have and what God has done. And I wanted to let you know that God's not done with you either. Okay? Somebody once said, what's the highest form of value that some people have? You know what some people would say? Cash. That's the biggest thing, one of the biggest things. But if I told you today, I said, let me ask you, if I was to give you a million dollars today, but to tomorrow you would be dead, what would you rather have, the million dollars, or would you rather have your life? The million or your life? Which one? Of course, you'd rather you'd want your life. That means time is more valuable than cash. All right. If I was to give you a million dollars today, and but you had to be sick for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? You'd want health. Health is more valuable than cash. If I gave you a million dollars today and said, are you going to have to choose one? About you know, one of your family members will die tomorrow. Which would you rather choose? You want to choose the relationship to be alive instead of the million. So it says relationships are more valuable than cash. Can we get an amen? That's why we have a pastor in here today that's getting ready to fly about 20, 25 hours, whatever it is, all the way to be able to minister to children. 72-year-old guy. He doesn't need to be doing all that, but God put something on his life. So we learned that, you know, no matter the cash values that we have, our health, our life, and our relationships are much more valuable. And if all that is so, then why are we being controlled by this thing that we think is so valuable? Do you know what you'll have? You'll have people that will work double shifts and miss their child's recital because they needed more money. They said, you know what, i got to go do this. Nope, I'm not going to be I've been told, you know what, if they were to get, be given a million dollars, guess what? They, they would be gone within two or three years. Some people would get money right away, and we've seen people on TV that win uh, the lottery. Guess what happens? All that money's gone. But I want to let you know right now that this past week, I got to see people graduate, okay, from elementary school, from high school, from different areas, and we prayed, and we wanted them to let them know one thing. You know what? Even my grandkids, let them know. Eternity is where our value should be. Can I get a, I got an amen. We need to be driven by the eternity because you know what? We're not all going to be here one day. You just heard him pray for three missionaries that we lost on the mission field. We have military people that are going to be lost in the next month. You're going to have people get a phone call that somebody on the, on the field for protecting our country is gone. Where do we put our value? Our value needs to be in Christ. Amen. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, if you would. Everybody's going to face eternity one day. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Now, faith is confident in what we hope for and assure about and what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commanded for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what we see was not made out of what was visible. It was faith, not in what they could do. Come on, somebody. It was faith in the one who they have created. The creator is God Almighty. He created everything. And our faith should be in Christ, not in the things that we see. Everything that, you know what, you know what Solomon said? He said in Ecclesiastes, everything we have is meaningless. Not that you don't put value in your family, not that you don't love it, not that you don't go to work, not that you don't work to try to have a nice house. Not a, he's letting you know one thing, that there's coming a day when all of us will stand before the Lord and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we're, that day is going to come one day. Look what it says, these men that had faith, what they did. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10 says, By faith Abraham... When called to go to a place, he would later receive an inheritance. Do you know that when he was called, God told him, you go. He goes, where am I going to go? Just go. He went by faith. He did what God told him. He obeyed and went. And even though he did not know where he was going, look at verse 9. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. 
he lived in tents and did Isaac as did Isaac and did Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham went by faith. Man, come on. You're going by faith. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know. You believe in what's going to go on there. It's going to go by faith. Now, I wanted to tell you, I said, when I went to district council, and I'm just building right here, all right? Went and saw this young man get up. His name is Michael Santiago. His dad was a minister and a missionary. His grandfather was a mission, mission, missionary. And he was a minister, graduate of Southeastern University, and he was a youth pastor in a little city. Has anybody ever heard of Mulberry right near? Right Mulberry. What's in Mulberry? Who's in Mulberry, all right? What's in Mulberry? All right, so he's a youth pastor. Now, my daughter and her husband, they were asked, they knew, they knew the Santiago. She went to school with them. And Mike, Mike, she said, is a down-to-earth guy. All of a sudden, Mike approached them and said, hey, I, I have a vision from God. Now, he's 24 years old. I want to know if you guys will come with me and move to a city called Raleigh, North Carolina, get regular jobs. Come on. You're not going to be paid anything because I'm not being paid. And God told me to move all the way there. I'm only 24 years old. I'm just out of college. I'm youth pastor in Mulberry. And guess what? God spoke to me and said, I'm to go there. So he youth pastored for a couple of years. He said, okay, he's going to go there. He showed pictures of him working at Panera Bread when he got there. Okay, Melody and Scott decided, no, they wanted to stay. But her best friend and her husband was one of the, the eight that went with them. Eight couples went with them to Raleigh, North Carolina. Now, he showed a picture of him working Panera Bread, and he told his kids, he said, because uh, he would get free um, bagels, right? He'd get bagels for free after he's worked. They, he'd take them home. And he'd tell the kids, what are we having for breakfast? He said, what would you have this morning? Bagels. That's what we get tomorrow. Hallelujah. He said, because he didn't have much money. He's working at Panera Bread. They, they sold everything they had. They moved up. And he said the apartment didn't even need first, last, or security. The lady said, you can rent here month to month. He said, I knew it was God. And he said, next thing you know, he showed a picture of meeting in his living room. Okay? Now, now this is within 11 years ago. So that's pretty quick. The next thing you know, he's meeting in the living room with these couples. People started coming. Within five years, another church said, we'd like to join with you. Ended up giving him their church. He now has four campuses and was voted in by the United States of the Assembly to be in general counsel as the under 40-year-old presbyter over all the kids, all within 11 years. And he stood there and said, I can't believe it's happening either. He still says, what did I do? Well, 11 years ago, he was in Mulberry, which 11 years ago was this, ladies and gentlemen, right? 11 years ago? Think, that's 2013. That's that, that quick ago. And he said, and all of a sudden, God has ended up blessing him. But the thing is, he understood the value in God and what God could do, and he didn't. He could have done like anybody else, stayed where he was at, kept his job, eventually maybe became the senior pastor. But when God gave him a revelation, just like he gave a retired pastor, get on a plane and go to Alaska, when he gave a revelation, he had Corky. You went to what country and did Wells for a while? Did, a small thing. Went down to Honduras for like a 10 day or 40. So, well, when God gave you, gives you the revelation, guess what he never looks at? He never looks at your checkbook. He doesn't look at anything because he's going to say, well, if you have to miss 10 days or you can take 10 days off work and go and it might cost you. God's going to supply that need over and back. God never owes anybody anything. He supplies everything. But God moves by the hand of faith. Now there's four campuses in Raleigh, North Carolina, because he saw the value of what God can do. And I want to let you know now, God has value in you. He loves you, and there's things that he can do. In Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 32. It's the hall of faith. And he says, and what more shall I say? Now he's writing this whole thing, all right? I do not have the time to tell you about Gideon, Barak. Samson, Japheth, about David, and Samuel, and the prophets. And through faith they conquered, look at this, kingdoms, administered justice, 
and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lions, quenched the furry fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength. This ought to be encouraging to us because these are the same people like you and I that God used. And then he goes, and who became, look at this, powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received their dead raised to life again. Ladies, I want to say this to you. When I was reading this, God wanted me to speak this. If your children are waylaid and spiritually dead, God's about to raise them back to life. He's calling them back. Don't you stop praying for them. God's going to bring them back in Jesus' name. If you believe that, give God praise in the house. Come on. He's going to raise them back, all right? God told me to share that. He's going to raise them back to life. And there were others. Watch this. Now, not everything was good for all that stepped in faith. Watch. Some of them were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might again, and even better, get a better resurrection. That means they saw eternity. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. Come on, man. And, and were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. But look what God says. But the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living some living in caves and holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them, golly, this is hard to read, received what had been promised, since God who planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Do you know what that means? There were some of them that said the Messiah's coming or the Messiah's about to return a second time. They were preaching. If you look in the Word, they believed Jesus said uh, He's coming back. Some of them believed that He'd be back before they were gone. They didn't get to see that promise, but it was for our benefit that they paved the way so that we could get the promise. We're living in the New Testament under the blood of Jesus. Some of those who died in the fire, come on somebody, who were set there and tortured before, not only talking in the New Testament, I'm talking about in the Old Testament, they still believed the Messiah was coming. They still believed in Jesus Christ. And they believed in the promises of God. Some of you are holding on to a prayer that you've been promised. Guess what? God's bringing it to pass. But my grandmother got to see me saved, but she didn't get to see my brother saved. She went on to be with the Lord, but my brother still got saved. And guess what? She was in heaven when Jesus called out his name, Daniel Edmund Sloan, putting in the Lamb's Book of Life. Mimi's in heaven. She got to see it, so they'll receive the promise on the other side. You ought to rejoice that when you pray, God hears your prayers, and the promises is coming to pass. Give God glory. Don't give up. Some of these people didn't see it. it went, what, what about Peter? He was hung upside down and crucified. Huh? Come on, what about Paul beheaded? Listen, uh, Matthew, uh, stabbed in the side in India, killed. Some of these guys died writing some of the word of the New Testament, and we get to receive the promise. We get the benefits of the joy of the Lord. We're joint heirs with Jesus. They paid the way that some of us don't have to. But I want to let you know now, like the missionary that got up there on Tuesday night, he said, don't you stop and think for a moment that we don't have missionaries sitting on the mission field that are hanging by a string being locked up in jail. We still got some that are beaten. There's some that are being tortured. We don't hear about it, but it's going on in other countries right now. So we need to continue to pray. But these people leave their families and everything to do what God told them to do. God's not done with you yet. Their faith was so strong that not even the death and beatings could defer them from doing the work of the Lord. How about you? Hmm? Are you willing to stand for God no matter what? We, had a, we put a high price on our jobs, our money, and sometimes we miss God's best. If God has spoken to you about something, do not let all that you think about and worry about determine the decision that God told you to do. I'm not saying don't worry. God wants you to work. I'm, ta- I'm talking about if God gave you something to do, maybe it's at your work. Start a little prayer group. Do it. Can I get an amen? You don't know what God's going to do. I remember in 1985, I got hired by Bradenton as a tree cutter. Well, actually, I was on the lawn crew first, tree cutter. I had two daughters, okay, that time. 
I lived in a little one bedroom, one bath house. Our other, uh, actually, the house was flo- floated over the Manatee River into Bradenton, little tiny house. And we had a little tiny garage off to the side where we had a washer and a dryer that we made a hookup in there. And back then, you could have your, your washing machine put the pipe outside, and it used to spread the water. Do you all remember those days? And then the county stepped in. Oh, no, you got to hook up to the sewer line now. you got to hook up the sewer line, you know. So you had to do what they told you to do. So we had to hook up and all that. Couldn't do it. And we had all that. And all of a sudden, I, I, uh, I get a phone call that, and I was, and at the same time, I was doing seminary, my seminary class. Paula would work at night from 4.30 till 10 o'clock at night, waiting on tables. I'd get home at 3.30. When I got home at 3.30, she'd have supper ready by 4 so we could eat supper with our two little girls at that time. Melody was three years old, and Candace was just a baby born, okay? So we had it. And you know what? God said to me, spoke to me. <laughs> it was 1988, 1989. Now, I'd been working there for almost four years coming up, and uh, Rick Bussey had come to me and said, hey, listen, our youth pastor resigned. I'd like you to take uh, the kids to summer camp. And at that time, the youth group was small, didn't have a whole lot. You know, The church was large, but the youth group was not very big. And he said, I want you to, to take these kids, and it was 15. And I said, I've never been to summer camp. I don't know what I'm doing. He said, Brian, you're in a Christian band. You've been ministering. You know that you can do this. Trust me. I said, okay. I said, well, let me talk to Paul. I went and talked to Paul, and she said, yeah, let's do it. And he said, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I, will you guys come? You take, I'm going to take care of you for that week, whatever your your bit. I said, no, I'll just take a vacation day. No, 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 I'll take care of it. Tell them you don't claim your vacation. I want to pay. I want to, I want you to do this. We're going to take you. Why don't you go? So by the time we got done, we had 31 kids. I'm looking at 31 kids on a bus on the way up, and I'm driving my station wagon with all the instruments in the back and all that because we got to set up the worship just like we do here. We had to go up to Brooksville to uh, Lakewood Retreat. You guys know where that is? And we're sitting there, and here we go, and I got no idea what I'm doing. I, I, I just knew how to play music. You know what? My pastor said, quit hiding behind your guitar. Quit hiding behind your guitar. I'm not telling you to stop doing what you're doing. I'm saying come out in the front of the guitar. So the first night, he, he was going to come up Tuesday, him and Don Morrison, they were going to help out. So I get the first night, we got the kids in there, I'll never forget it. I, I, I preached on, um, I believe it was David and Goliath, you know, an easy one. But it's not easy when you're dealing with teenagers because they know fake and real. Teenagers know fake and real, all right? Next thing I know, they're at the altar, I'm laying hands on a girl named Teresa, She's the first one to come up. I, hit, I felt the heat hit my hand. She fell out under the power, and I'm looking at her. She went down. Ed Ferner's over here. This one's hitting the floor. All of a sudden, we had somebody over here. She's over there weeping. Before you knew it, all of them were at the altar weeping before God and praying. I'm going, I don't know what I just did. God, but thank you. You know, I'm sitting there. I didn't. I did. You guys laugh, but when you're, you know, I'm only at that time, 28, 29, and green behind the ears. I knew ministry, but I never had that ministry. And then all of a sudden, I get off the bus. No, uh, I drove my car. I get off the bus, and he meets with me in the hallway, and he says, listen, I'm gonna, I've am gonna. i never seen people with more natural talent than you and Paula. I'd like for you to be our full-time youth pastor. I go, blah, 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 blah. what? Yeah. So I went to Paul, and I said, should I leave the secure job? We prayed, and she was hanging laundry out in our laundry at that time. Our house was here, and our, and our garage was there, and we had a wire. Do you remember when you used to do wire, wire, and then you hang the laundry, and underwear is always in the inside so nobody can see your underwear and all the other clothes are on there? You remember, remember those days? You put them out, and you know what? It was sort of neat to have it dry like that. It always felt fresh and crisp, you know? And so she's sitting there, and she goes, I believe that you should lay down what you're doing at the city, because I loved working at the city, and, and you should do this. Now, little did she know. That, that wasn't what Rick was asking. He was asking for both of us. She had to lay down what she was doing also. He wanted that. He said, don't worry. And you know what? Because we did that, I added it up this week. I had said it before, but I got prayer. We've been helpful in six church plants. We've helped over 60 missionaries. We've seen hundreds get saved. And Zane and Karen and Paul and I get the privilege of every Monday night going to a Dunkin' Donuts watching children walk in a back door of donuts that don't have the money that we feed 
and watch them receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. How many know we stepped out by faith, not knowing what was going to happen, but we believed what God had said in our life. And when we did that, and the man who helped me plant when our first church without, we always went and helped churches plant. It was our turn by ourselves, and it was, his name is Milton Dice. He just received, did he not, his 50-year pen starting at the age of 24. He's 74. He got a 50-year pen as an ordained minister who is now a missionary to RV camps around the United States. He's still doing the work of the Lord. And in the process, lost his first wife to brain cancer about 15 years ago. Married to his second wife. They minister. And guess what? Watch this, bro. Watch this. He, he when he's in town, goes to Lakeland and goes to the same church that my daughter Melody goes to. And they love Melody and they hug her. What would be the odds of all that happening that Melody would end up at the same church where the guy who helped plant us a church, who's a U.S. missionary, that blessed them. As a matter of fact, said, we want to take you to the church dinner and paid for her two sons and her to go. How'd that happen? Because there was a God who was watching, who knew that if you stepped out by faith, that little two-year-old girl in that home when we stepped out by faith, God already knew that there'd come a day when she was 40, living that they would be at the same church and be able to minister to her. You ought to put your hands together and praise God. How does God know that? How does God know that? Because he's God. Hallelujah. I thought it was exciting when I called Melody about Michael Santiago. She said he's the most down-to-earth guy, you know. Let me tell you who else I had the opportunity to meet. You're going to love this. Malcolm Boule. Anybody know him? Boule. I call him Boule. You say Boule. I say Boule. Every time I meet him, he's a, he's the, he was the president of the Black Fellowship of the Assemblies of God, but he wasn't always. He had a small church in Tampa. Jerry Rayburn brought him up this past week. <laughs> Every time I run into him, I say, hey, Mountain, how you doing? He said, you got that $15 you borrowed from me? <laughs> so this time when I saw him, I haven't seen him in a long time, I said, Malcolm, did you get that $15 I mailed to you in the mail? He said, no, I never received it. You know, <laughs> he just jokes like that. He just retired. He was, him and his wife ministered a small church in Tampa. Terry Rayburn met him in 1999, asked him to eventually be a head of the Black Fellowship for the Penn, Florida. He agreed to do that. The next thing you know, he just stepped down because he was obedient to what God had told him to do, not knowing that he was going to be. He just stepped down after, was it 20 years or 15 years? U.S. Missions Director for the entire United States of America. So you never know what God is going to do where you work at and what you do. Then I had a, the privilege. I got a phone call last week from Mario. You know Mario DK? He's South Beach Ministries. Mario DK calls me up. Mario's no longer. We, we helped support him about 26 years ago when he and his wife showed up at Harvest Chapel. When we were meeting at Sug Middle School, a Jesse G. Miller and Millie Middle's Day time. And she shows up. And she's got a newborn, and she's got her little two-year-old. And he said, we're, we want to know uh, if we could candidate, uh, not candidate, uh, uh, itinerate at your church and let people know <coughs> I'm Cuban, and I want to hit the streets of Miami, and I believe God's called me to minister to South Beach. So he said, yeah. Well, we struck up a relationship. We've been friends ever since. We sort of lost contact over the years, but he ended up moving to uh, Springfield, and he's now the dean of, of Global University's Berean Bible School section. Now watch this. This is amazing. They're there. He calls me up. He wants to go out and eat. Little did I know, he said, he's sitting across the table. He took us out night before last. He said, I want to let you know this. He said, if you guys need anything, you want to do higher education, you got people raising up any young people, get a hold of me. It's, it's, an on, it's not a campus thing. It's a, it's a, you do it at home. It's online kind of thing. Right now, he is dean over, let me say, let me say how many students. One million. And here I watched him walk and pray with me over the parking lot at Sug Middle School with a little kid. Little did I know that in days to come, God would have him the dean over, over around the world. They have a million students for Berean. And it's educational to teach young people or whoever 
our age to be able to learn the gospel in a different way and maybe do Sunday school class or whatever. And he's sitting across and talking. And we had the time of our life. It was awesome. And I got in the car. I told Paul, I said, you don't know what God does with your faith. You have faith. You don't know what God is going to do for you. Just And I'm not saying, yeah, not, let me understand. I'm not talking about faith having to do a ministry and lay every, I'm talking about just trust God with your gift and who you are to change your atmosphere and those that are around you. That's all I'm saying. You don't know. And you don't know in years to come if you're not going to run into somebody that's now has over a million people that are learning the gospel. Here's what I'm saying. We should be people of purpose. I want to ask you a question. Is it wrong to ask the Lord to bless you? I don't think it is. Some people think it is, but bless me. I'm going to prove it to you. First Chronicles 4.10, the prayer of Jabez. Oh, God called out, oh, that you would bless me indeed, that you'd enlarge my territory, that your hand would be upon me and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. Look, so God granted what he requested. There's four little simple things. Number one, he said, bless me indeed. We're to ask God to bless us. Number two, he said, expand my territory. Bring people from the north, south, east, and west into my life, God. Put my name on their hearts that when I, they come, I can share your son's name. Pray those. There's nothing wrong with praying those kind of things. Number two, God, do everything with me. When I'm with you, God, do it with me that I please you, Lord. And then look at this. Keep evil away from me. How many want that? Come on. Keep me from things that keep me from you. You know what? Sometimes you have to check what you're looking at and what you're doing. You want God to keep evil from you? Well, also make sure you're doing the things God wants you to do. And you know what? Don't take anything less. Don't take anything less. See, you can't serve God and mammon. You have to make a choice. Is God number one or all the other stuff number one? Which one's number one? And I'm getting ready to round it up. I'm going to ask you a question. Can you make God marvel at what you do? Like God go, wow. I got a yes. I got a yes. Watch this. Watch this. Look at Luke chapter 7. Is Jesus God in the flesh? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, right? Watch this. Now, when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum, and a certain centurion servant who was dear to him and was sick, uh, dear to him, was sick and ready to die. So when he heard that Jesus was coming, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying, "Those the one of whom he should do this was deserving." For he loves our nation, and he has built a synagogue, this guy. you got to come to his house, is what he's saying. Then Jesus went with them. And when the guy heard, <laughs> was already not far from his house, the centurion sent friends to him. He said, no, to get the picture. He's kid is sick, the servant is sick, so he sends somebody to Jesus. He says, say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But you say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am a man placed under authority. I have soldiers underneath me. And he says, and I say to the one, go and do this. And, and to the other, come. And he comes. And my servants, they do this. In other words, he's saying, tell Jesus, I'm a man under authority. All you need to do, don't have to come. When I tell people to do it, they do it. It does it. When Jesus heard these things, well, what did he do? He marveled at him. What? He marveled at him. Watch this. 
and turned around and said to the whole crowd that was following, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not in all of Israel. This was a centurion soldier. This isn't even his religion. This isn't even Paul. But he knew enough who Jesus was, God's son. And he said, you just say the word. And he said, I've not found all of this great faith in all of Israel. Now those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. And I've marked under here, Jesus marveled at him. He's not, this guy was not a religious guy who believed in Jesus through the miracle. And you know, all your Bible reading, all your praying, whether you're tithing and giving, there's nowhere in the word that says that makes God marvel. But it made God marvel that he believed Christ enough that whatever Christ promised from his word, he do. If that's kind of faith you have it, you get God's attention. Let me not forget, it was the blind man that yelled out, Jesus! And when he yelled it out, he got Jesus' attention. You can get Jesus' attention by the faith that you have because what happened when the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment? Everybody was around him, but yet he said, who touched me? God knows when people have faith in him and trust him enough. You need, you got, you got a loved one lost, keep believing God. You got a sickness, you keep praying. You just heard a man say, I'm a 47 year survivor of cancer. Who do you think did that? God touched him and did it. Listen, and he's about to put him on a plane and fly him halfway around the world to a country called, uh, to a country, to a state called Alaska in the northern part that's not too far away from Russia. Genesis 1.16 says this. God made two lights, the greater light to rule the day, which was the sun. I, I love this. And the lesser light to rule the night. And then he has to put in there, oh, and he made the stars also. <laughs> he, he says in the Bible, no, God made the sun, God made, oh, and, the, and the stars also. Okay? And he made the stars also. God says that he made light and day, lesser light, he also. Nothing in the universe uh, made by God, okay, he's, listen, watch this, he's made stars, he made the sky, he made animals, he made people, but nothing marvels God at all, but we see one word in, in scripture, when the guy said, you just say the word, you don't even need to tithe. This is the creator of the universe. And, and the guy wasn't even a follower of Jewish customs and stuff. But he knew enough to know. See, you don't have to know everything in this word, which is the most important book to read. I want to tell you, all of his promises are yes and amen. Every bit of it. It's real. It's still power. Kings have come and kings have gone. And it still stands. It's still the best seller in the whole world. It's still here all these years later. People come. Because God's word, he said, listen, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not. God marveled at the point that the man said, hey, listen, you just say it, and guess what will happen? So I want to let you know this. <laughs> when a parent or a teenager or anybody up in age like myself, anybody, when you believe the word of the Lord Jesus Christ, God is going to marvel and move on your behalf. Believe in his promises. I didn't get a lot of amens. Come on. Hebrews 11, 6 tells us, Without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. I can say this to you. I don't see everything come to pass sometimes. Okay? Sometimes I can't feel what I pray. Okay? I don't have all the answers. But we just sang a song, Waymaver, even though I can't feel that you're working, you're working. Listen, what did, I t what did I say before? I said, when you take a seed and you put it in the ground, you don't see it working. But guess what? It comes up. Can I get an amen? I have confidence in God. How about you? Come on. 
He can save my child, heal my body, take care of my needs, and know that one day I'll see him in heaven. 2 Timothy 1.12 says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know that whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed unto him until that day. Come on, somebody. I know it. I know where I'm going when I die. How do you know? Because Jesus is my Lord. He paid the price for all my sin on the cross. And he listened. He gave his Holy Spirit to live in me that I can overcome and walk by faith. I just need to trust him. You just say the word and I will believe. Come on, somebody. Come on. Just say the word and I will believe, Lord. Are you there? Come on, somebody. That made Jesus marvel. He would say the word. So what do you put your value in? A 40-hour paycheck, sometimes overtime, or do you put your faith in God? Where do you put it at, right? You know, Pastor Don, Pastor Zane, everybody here, everywhere I read in the Word, I'm getting ready to round it up, The Bible says that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. Except for one place. There's only one time that I never see him sitting at the right hand of God. Because see, remember, Jesus is up there. The Holy Spirit is here on the earth. He lives in us. Now watch this. You're going to love this. Watch it. Go to Acts 7 and we're going to end round up for this. I'm just trying to encourage your faith just to believe in what he says. 7.55 7.55 says, but he, talking about Stephen, Stephen was being stoned to death. He, being filled with the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus, read it, standing at, this is Stephen. This is the disciple who, who they didn't want preaching. So what they do, they took stones and they're throwing rocks at him and he's getting ready to die. And he's down there and he looks up and they beat him. He stands up and he says, <laughs> Then he saw the glory of God. And then he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Stephen looked up and saw it. And I put this. I want everybody to look. Anytime that you stand for Jesus, he'll stand for you. Anytime you stand up for Jesus, say, yes, he is. I believe he stands for you. That's my boy down there. That's my my daughter. Keep doing. It's the only time we see him stand up. And Stephen took the beating. And I said, any time that you see that you stand for Jesus, he'll stand for you. We have the ability to make Jesus marvel and to stand up. What your faith in Jesus can do. It can make him marvel. And it can make him stand up. And understand, he's God and we are not. Huh? We're mortal men, but the difference is not only are we mortal men, he's decided to live right in your heart. And he put the promises and he said, listen, you can do all things through Christ who gives you the strength. If it's God's will, got to make sure what God's will is, you know. 24-year-old man looks at his wife and says, I've been praying. I know we're youth pastors, but we're to, we're to move to a city where we don't know anybody called Raleigh, North Carolina. What? Okay. So, yeah, but God's going to get some people to go with us. And it took eight people, four, you know, you figure that's 16 all together. And they went up there. Everybody left their jobs, left everything they had, took off, and they all went to a city. They rented hotel, uh, uh, rented rooms, and they're starting to meet. And what now? God's going to bring them. So he's working at Panera. I'm sure when he was working at Panera, he told somebody that I got a Bible study going on in my house. All of a sudden, two more people show up. Then four people show up. Pretty soon, everybody's at the work telling people, here comes 10 people, 20. Pretty soon, his whole room is filled up. Next thing you know, he's got a church that's exploding and blowing. Five years later, another church said, 